So I've um, updated the code snips file and pushed that to master and also <coughs> corrected some other omissions. So it's a good time um, to pull branches down from the repository to update some of the files we have. Just as a small aside, um, before this uh, little section on subsetting reloaded, I've put in code. Danielle came up to me and said, well, you, you said it's easy to make these column names with paste. And yeah, it is, if you remember how to do it. And then I spent a little while trying to remember, how the hell was this easy to do? Um, <clears throat> kind of reminds me of, of that joke about the mathematics professor who um, says, um, write something on the blackboard and says that, you know, it's, it's a really trivial proof that, that this uh, proposition is true. And he continues his lecture and then he turns back to his blackboard um, for which he's just said it's really trivial to f prove that this is true. And he looks at it and he thinks and he looks at it and he thinks and he looks at it more and he thinks some more and this goes on for five minutes and it goes on for seven minutes and of course the students are getting very restless. And then uh, he says, ah yeah, of course, um, yeah. And turns around and says, well, as I said, it's really trivial to prove that. And then he continues his lecture. <laughs> so it is really easy to, to work, to, to build these column names with, uh, with paste. Um, oh, you do want to know how, how this is proven? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> Danielle actually showed me that the key of the result is to use the, the repeat function. Um, so if we define a vector of, say, the cell types, a is the Bs and the NKs and, and whatever. And the vector B, which is just control and LPS, if we use the repeat function for that two times, we get B and K mo PDC, B and K mo PDC. That's not what we need to paste that together. But if we use the parameter each, then we get B, B, and K, and K, mo, mo, PDC, PDC. So thanks, Danielle, for that. Now we can, we can simply paste this vector together with the control and the LPS. And that gives us B control, B LPS. Of course, we need to define that the separator should be a dot. And we need to add genes at the beginning and clusters at the end. And so this is a function that does something similar to what we wanted before. So this is in the, in the code snips, in the updated code snips file, which appears um, after you've downloaded it, after you've uh, issued pull from version control. Now, subsetting reloaded. <coughs> um, we, were, we were doing a few simple tasks here. I, I think the first one was hopefully really easy. Rows 1 to 10 of the first two columns in reverse order. So the first two columns are just 1, 2, 2. And reverse order is just 10, 2, 1. Right? Very simple. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. These are the row names. Um, <clears throat> The next one is a little more involved. We need to use order. G names and the expression values for uh, monocytes.lps for the top 10 expression values. So in order to do that, um, I start by making a little subset to develop this with. 
If I want to look at orderings and sortings and figure out what I, if what I'm doing is right, and I do that on a thousand rows at once, um, my head is going to start spinning very quickly. So develop things with synthetic data, develop things with small subsets until you figure the syntax out, then apply it to your real problem. That's, that's uh, a smart way to do it. So we have a vector x, which has these values, large and small values. So we want the top 10 expression values. And <clears throat> to get the top 10, we need to sort them in some way and then we just pick the leftmost or the rightmost values from our sorted vector. Except we want indices, not values, so we need the order function. So if we do order of x, 12, 19, 1. So number 12 is minus 11, dot 2. Um, number 19 is minus 11.1. One, uh, number one is minus 10.6, so they go from smallest to largest in that order. Now I could pick the rightmost from that result vector, but that's kind of inconvenient. What's more convenient is if I reverse the ordering and order by decreasing is false. Decreasing is true. Sorry, true. 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 There we go. So two five nine eighteen. So two is minus six point four. Five is three four minus eight point five. Nine is also minus eight point five and so on. So this now orders them in the largest first and then the smallest. And in order to use that vector to get the values, um, I just need x and then this. And I wanted the 10 most, or that's you know, it's a small, small example, so I say the 5 most. And that gives me the values. Minus 6.4 is the largest, then two 8.5s, then 8.8, .8, .8, minus 8.9, .9, so they get smaller as we, as we go along. All right, now that we figured out how to do this in principle, <clears throat> we want G names and expression values for this, for the top 10 expression values. So, um, Let's first make our selection. <clears throat> this gives me all whatever thousand um, genes here. And then I want Hang on, I want um, decreasing is true. And I want from the vector that this produces, I want the first 10, which correspond to the indices of the 10 highest values in that column. Then I can simply pull things out. LPS dat is order, and I want G names and expression values. That was um, genes. Row 205. 
H2EB1 has this expression value. Rho2 CXC L10 has this expression value and so on. Now, if I were a researcher in mouse hematology, that would probably already tell me something. Probably, possibly, maybe not, because we're actually just looking at raw values, and raw values are, you know, um, what we're usually looking for is change, i.e. comparison between conditions. So we're not looking for the, usually, for the raw uh, level of, um, of expression of, say, H2EB1, but we're looking for the genes that have the greatest difference. So this brings us to, to, to this question here. Um, find all genes for which B cells are stimulated by LPS by more than two log units. <clears throat> so the, the table contains log expression values. Um, B cells stimulated by LPS. <coughs> That's uh, something like B. Um, LPS that dollar B LPS minus LPS that dollar B control. So each of these is a vector of numbers of expression values. If I subtract from the stimulated value, the control value, I get the amount of stimulation. So this is one vector. I subtract another vector. So this is done element by element. And this gives me a third vector, which is the amount of stimulation. And I want, for those, I want the ones that are greater than 2. Is 2 a good choice? Well, you know, we're here to explore data. So basically, the, the, the first step that I would do here is plot a histogram. And this gives me this histogram. So this is a distribution of stimulation values. And uh, as you can see, um, it kind of looks like a normal distribution, but um, it, has a, it has a large tail of stimulation values above 2. And you know that's maybe, I don't know, 2% of the genes or something like that. So in order to use a filtering on that, <clears throat> I'm asking for more than two. So I want each of these values for which um, that, ex that difference is greater than two. So. If I apply this to um, a vector, I find that all of these are true. Why is that the case? Well, maybe they've been ordered. The table was sorted initially by these values. and they're all false. OK, so that's just a selection vector, though. It, it's a vector. It has um, 1,341 elements. They're all logical elements. Now I can use these to subset. And I wanted all genes. So LPS. Um, genes. Um, 
Now, before I do that and print that, I'm, I usually al always cautiously check how many numbers this is going to give me. So we have a logical vector. How, how do we find out how many true values are in that vector? Sum. Yes. We've discussed this the two days before. So if we sum over a logical vector, um, <clears throat> what happens is that sum requires a numeric value but we have logicals instead. So R tries to cast the logical value into numeric value, and that's possible. There's a definition of how this is done. A false value is cast into the number zero, and a true value is cast into the number one. So if we sum over that conveniently, every true value adds one to the result, and thus the result is the number of true values in the vector. which is 30. Okay, that's fine. We can print that. So LPS dat cell of genes is this, this list here. And the final one <coughs> may be less trivial than the others. Expression values for all genes whose gene names appear in figure 3b. Hint, use the in operator. So those of you who were here yesterday might remember that the in operator compares two vectors and is true for every element of the first vector that appears in the second vector and false for the, every element of the first vector which does not appear in the second vector. So in this case, um, Again, we, we write a little. <clears throat> I like to do this in two steps. Do, basically, define my selection first and then apply the selection to the data object. It's a lot easier to troubleshoot this, uh, look at the selection in between, see, you know, does it have as many elements as we think it should? Do the elements actually make sense rather than just dumping out the results? So my selection here is LPS. Genes in um, characteristic genes. So, car, car genes. So, my selection is a logical vector of. 1341, of course. It has to be as long as LPS dat dollar genes. Same number of rows, so I, I, can, I can use it for subsetting. Um, how many of these are true? Same thing, sum over selection is 45. So 45 of the genes for which I have expression values are also contained in these characteristic genes here. Um, The length of that is actually 46. So there's one of them in there that does not appear in our gene list. I think when I looked at what the problem was there, well, with basically turning this around and asking which characteristic genes are in LPS dat dollar genes, I can figure out which is the one that's missing. And I think what I figured out is that um, from the time they prepared the figure and the the time that they prepared the table, one of the genes actually was renamed with an alias, which happens all the time. So it has a different name in the figure than it has in the table, which once again tells you don't trust data at all. Anyway, so this is the expression vector. And now if we want the expression values or the entire table, um, we can just subset it by these 46 genes. go. So these are just the expression values for these 
46 genes. All right. So, commit code snips update commit close and push there we go let's do something else I hope this was informative and illustrative um, you know this is this is really the kind of day-to-day -day thing that we need all the time subsetting um, filtering data the first step of any kind of exploratory analysis is looking at your data and figuring out what's there Well, you would you would need to grep with a pattern that matches everything that is in the table. And that's possible. So just to illustrate how we would use grep for that, um, grep the pattern in LPS that dollar genes. And now what's a pattern that matches CD69 or CXL10 or IFI47? Well, that's matching this or matching that or matching this or matching that. And, you know, un 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 until I run out of patience, I can continue doing that. But that gives me the correct regular expression to find, in this case, the rows 1, 2, 3, 4. So it does work with grep. But the challenge is, is to find a regular expression which matches all of these examples. Alternatively, you could grep them in turn in a for loop and assign them. Alternatively, you could remember what we've talked about yesterday and the day before and use the in operator. There are also, you know, <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> so this is, this is how, how you would use grep or in. Oh, yeah. if, if you've and noticed then, type info yeah, and, sure. and in the script and you wanted to use it just to place that <laughs> with object info, um, I've, I've renamed it. I, I, should have, I, should have re I should have found and replaced it globally and I didn't. And it, it'll be there in the next update. So type info and object info is the same thing. Incidentally, oh, you, can, you can just do the following. Um, Type info yeah. object info. Right. Remove the parentheses, otherwise you'll you'll be getting the output of object info. And if I do that, now I have two functions defined that are exactly the same, but now I can call the same function by two, two different names. Right? Yeah. So so this may be helpful. Sorry for that. Oversight. Okay, so we're already exploring data. Let's look a little bit more about exploring data. Um, there are, you know, many tools available. Don't, don't think of exploratory data analysis, meaning to use the most sophisticated algorithms. Exploring data analysis, exploratory data analysis, most of all means 
becoming familiar with your data and describing it in different ways. So um, initially, the simplest thing that we can do about our data is, is trying to look at summary statistics. So for example, subsetting. For example, if we <clears throat> build a little um, a vector of random numbers, 100 normally distributed random numbers with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, we can ask, what's the mean of this? And which is a small number. Not exactly 0, because they're random, but they're kind of sorted around 0. I can ask for the median which is slightly different, but also a very small number. I can ask for the interquartile range, the variance, the standard deviation, uh, the summary. Summary is, is, gives you a number of values here, the minimum, the maximum, and uh, the, the values at the quartiles. So at the first quartile, at the median, it also gives you the mean, and at the third quartile. So between first and quart third quartile, uh, the difference between these two is the interquartile range. So what are quartiles anyway? So quartiles um, work by ranking a set of values, and then taking the first quarter of the ranked values, and then the second quarter of the ranked values, first 25%, second 25%, third 25% and the last 25%. So these are, these are four quartiles of, of uh, sorted values. The one value at 50%, so if you have 100 values, the one that appears at position 50, if we, if we rank them, um, this is the median. So median <clears throat> is kind of similar in, in idea to the mean, but it's more robust. The mean is heavily influenced by outliers. The median is less influenced by outliers. So if I have a random distribution in the way that I've calculated it, and then I add a value of 10,000 to that, my mean is going to be way, way, way skewed towards 10,000. But my median will be uh, barely moving at all. Um, quantiles ask, what's the threshold that has a given fraction of values above or below it? So, <clears throat> for example, I could ask, you know, what's the cutoff for the highest 10% uh, of my values, or the cutoff of my highest 1%? And we do, we do that um, by quantiles. These are... Yeah, I could just I could just plot that here. So if if I have a normal distribution, um, my ninety percent quantile would lie here. This means ninety percent of the values are to the left, and ten percent of the values are to the right. Um, Mathematically speaking, this corresponds to the integral. So the integral of the distribution to the left of this cutoff here is 90%, um, and the integral to the right for the area under the curve um, is 10%. Is A graphical um, view of distributions of data or, or where these things uh, lie is often done with a box plot. So this is a box plot. You see these things quite frequently. Um, what we see here is the mean in a, in a bold line. Um, what's in the box? 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So the median, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have the median in the middle. Then we have the the inner two quartiles. The the f so the cutoff here is the first and the third, and this one is. 1.5 times the interquartile range. And if anything is outside of that, it's uh, plotted explicitly uh, as, as explicitly shown values. So, so this kind of um, quite nicely shows you um, distributions. But um, box plots can obscure important structure in your data. For example, if we have a bimodal distribution of two um, normal distributions with different means. So one normal distribution with a mean of minus two and one normal distribution with a mean of plus two. The histogram for that would be bimodal. So centered around minus two and then around plus two. But if we simply look at a box plot of this, it doesn't look very remarkable at all. So if we have a, a normal distribution or a unimodal distribution, it can be sort of nicely um, illustrated with, um, with a box plot. But if there's any structure in this, um, we, it gets obscured. Of course, if we have only a single distribution, it would only, always be better just to look at the histogram. But if we have a number, i.e. like 10 that we look, want to look at side by side, then histograms become cumbersome. Um, so somebody came up with the, with the smart idea, well, why don't we take these histograms and we turn them sideways and, and we just, you know, put them side by side like box plots. And that's um, actually, in principle, what the so-called violin plot does. Um, violin pl plots are in the ggplot package. If you have... Um, used ggplot in, our, in, in, in the integrated assignment uh, two days ago. You already have it. Um, if you haven't, it's worthwhile to download it. And um, <clears throat> this is a violin plot of the distribution we just had. So essentially, think of this as a side-by-side as a -side view of, of a box plot. And you can get, you know, many of these side by side um, like that. Now, if we do a box plot or a violin plot of more than one column, they're placed uh, side by side. So for example, um, if we take uh, box plots for N natural killer cell controls in the LPS, These are the, the log values here as box plots. Or if we want to see box plots of all of them, <coughs> this is our distribution. So this is something we often do as a first step um, before we do quantitative analysis on the data. We just see. Do, do, do our data sets have approximately the same range and where there are outliers? Um, is that something that we can explain uh, from the way that we've done uh, the analysis? Or is that something that, um, that may correspond to a systematic error uh, in the data analysis? Maybe one of our um, RNA-seq experiments went wrong or, or was contaminated with things or, or whatever. And then we would see that one of the box plots is really an outlier. Can you please repeat that violin plot? I mean, why would you use it? Why would I use it? Yeah. Uh, if, if, if I have a bimodal distribution, I need two distributions in there. If I just put a single box there, I don't see anything about the inner structure of my data. I don't see whether it's unimodal or bimodal or whether it has more, more structure. The violin plot is basically like a histogram of the thing turned on the side, and it shows me what the actual structure of my data is. You can see it using the 
the histogram yeah. itself, right? The right. So, so think of the box plot as a histogram with only one bar. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the violin plot is a smooth histogram with many bars. So you can see that there's uh, more information. Okay, um, now I have a rather lengthy file in scripts, which is called plotting reference. That's uh, something you can, you can work through and refer to at your leisure. It basically summarizes important principles and important um, Plots that we that we use frequently and, and, and important plots and their their parameters. So it has sections on types of plots and colors and how to add lines and how to add titles and legends and what plot symbols there are and how you draw on plots and what happens if we do scatter plots uh, of spatial data, i.e., with x, y, z coordinates, and so on. Um, so. Um, just as a um, standard thing here, standard uh, scatter plot, let's <coughs> um, make two random distributions. One is normally distributed, one is um, an x cubed scaled and noise added version of the first one. Um, if we scatter plot this, it'll give us a cloud of points. Um, there's something called um, <clears throat> a rug representation. So this is um, a rug representation. It puts little bristles on your scale, like in a, in a rug, that correspond to the actual values, and, and you can uh, better appreciate the density of, of these things, of, of your data distributions. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in that that, that you can just use and study. Um, I might refer back to that from time to time. But I think uh, for now, I'll, I'll just close it. Um, if, we, if we have kind of downtime while people are you know, working through tasks, then do feel welcome to explore this more. <clears throat> so just as an example of how to plot a histogram and then overlay it with a, with a line plot, we could ask, well, if we have, you know, stimulated cells, simulated expression, what does that look like? Is, does that look like a normal distribution? So for example, if I calculate my stimulations, and then plot a histogram, uh, B cells LPS minus B cells controls. Um, I define a color as a, as a light blue color. I give it a title. I give it a label on the x-axis with x-lab stimulation of the change in the log expression values. And I set frequencies to false. So I don't get the actual counts, but I get um, counts divided by the total number. <clears throat> and then I can define some values from the largest, uh, from the smallest to the largest values, you know, in, in an interval of 0.1 and plot a curve along that line. So along uh, if these x value curve, um, I can uh, get the, the values for the normal distribution with the norm. This is the density of the normal distribution at that point. So that now is a curve that, that traces the normal distribution itself. And with the lines command, I can overlay that. So with this, I can immediately see that um, if I have a normal distribution with the same standard deviation as 
the histogram as, as the points that I have here, um, it's not as steep as what I see here. Basically, that says um, this is not normally distributed data, but we have outliers that go outside of the normal distribution much further than, than we would uh, just expect if this, this were a normal distribution. No wonder we're, we're looking at a biological mechanism here. And, and basically, just one glance at this image will tell me, hey, there's actually something going on. This is not just random noise. Um, there's, this is significantly or, or strongly different from a random, um, from a random distribution. Another way to to look at this and ask about um, how similar or different is this from a random distribution is to use so-called quantile quantile plots. So quantile quantile plots match quantiles of one distribution against quantiles of another distribution. The quantiles, the distributions, or the, the values we have for our distributions don't have to be of the same length. So we don't match them element by element, but we match them quantile by quantile. So these are so-called QQ plots. Um, QQ norm is a plot of data the data we've defined above, my stimulation, against the normal distribution. And this kind of characterizes the um, deviation from expectation if our expectation is a normal distribution. So uh, we can plot a QQ line. So kind of in the middle here, this would correspond to a normal distribution. But both at the small end as well as the as the large and their significant deviation from the normal distribution. So again, this shows us the distribution of our biological data is not normal. Um, there are outliers there which go much further out than we would expect if this were uh, just randomly sampled. And as this is a plot, we can add a legend to this as we always should. In light blue, LPS effect, and in red here is the normal distribution. <clears throat> so QQ norm intrinsically compares your data with the normal distribution. If you want to compare data with data, you need something called the QQ plot. Um, but it works in a similar way. So my simulation could be LPS dat of stimulated B cells against controlled uh, B cells. A baseline could be uh, monocytes against B cells, uh, both controls. And then we compare these two against each other. And now we see that, especially on the side of the outliers, this is much more shallow. So there is no real reason to believe that fundamentally um, the stimulation alone um, uh, against against the sample um, is is just the same. So there's there there are also slight things going on. <clears throat> All right. Now. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on scatter plots, because after basically looking at our data and looking at the distribution of values with means and standard deviations, with box plots and looking with how, how the data are individually um, distributed, the very next thing we are usually interested in when we explore our data is, are there any correlations? So if one thing is high, is there anything that, may, that predicts that another thing should also be high or that it should be low? So this is the way <clears throat> we analyze our data um, and start searching for functional effects. Because if we see that some measured value is high when another measured value is high, um, the interpretation is usually that that is due to the fact of one thing having an effect on another thing, and which we would be interested in. Maybe one causes the other, 
or both of them are caused by a third effect, by a confounding factor. Pulling that out of our data, pulling these influences out of our data, um, is the first step to analyzing our, observation, our observations in terms of some biological mechanism. And after all, this is, this is what our um, data analysis essentially is all about. So let's, let's start looking at scatter plots, basically two-dimensional plots of one thing against another thing. Um, I have provided a data set here. <clears throat> this has been floating around in CBW for ages. I don't even remember where it originally came from. Um, this is flow cytometric data of graft versus host disease. And um, these are uh, different cha channels here, FSC, SSC, CD4, um, FITC, CD8, uh, BPE, so this is probably fluorescin, and this is phycoerythrin, and this is uh, some other uh, fluorophore. So um, these are three different cell types, and one cell type measured with two different uh, fluorophores. Um, so if we only extract this the CD3 positives. So let's, <clears throat> so column five here, one, two, three, four, five. These are cells that are labeled with CD3. This is the histogram of that. So some of, there's a, there's a peak here and then it, it kind of falls off. So at some point we need to define what do we consider CD3 positive? Some cutoff here. So for example, we could say, well, a cutoff is um, greater than 280, so something like this. That probably would give us uh, three, the top three-quarter quantile of, of where, the, where this is located. We can use that to subset in this example as data frame this thing here and subset it into graft versus host disease CD3 positives. And <clears throat> now this contains some of the rows, um, and the expression, uh, the the fluorescent values of CD4, CD8, CD3, and CD8 again. Now we can simply plot the first two columns, i.e. this would plot for uh, row 4, the uh, CD4 value against the CD8 value. For row 6, the CD4 against the CD8 value. So this is, if we plot two-dimensional data, plot is a, is, is, is a, is a function that, that is very versatile. Plot kind of recognizes what the data is that you're try, trying to plot and then plots it in the appropriate form. So if you give it two-dimensional data by default, it will give you a scatter plot. So we get a scatter plot here. Scatter plots like this make for rich exploratory inference. So you see something like that. What do you know about your data? What does, what does this tell the biologist about the data? We're, we're plotting along one dimension on the x-axis, along another dimension on the y-axis. Things that we've selected. Hmm? Looks like there's four cell populations. Right. So this is not a homogeneous population that's centered on something and then just has a random distribution of values. We have four cell populations, um, which correspond fundamentally to the four possibilities of being CD4 positive and CD8 positive. So the CD4 and CD8 can be both negative, i.e. Um, lingering around 100, or they can be both positive, like centered on, on 500. So something like that is extremely, extremely useful. Um, so 
if to explore scatter plots a, a little bit more, um, we should consider, but we'll do that when we come to actually plotting examples. We should consider that we can use different plotting symbols and characters. We can adjust the size of the symbols here to basically tell us something about a third dimension of values. We can use colors. So for example, if we plot something of our LPS data and it's already been um, subset into, or, or already clustered into different clusters, we could color one cluster um, green and one cluster blue and one cluster red and then see how these defined clusters distribute on a scatter plot and so on. Um, one thing that I just wanted to show here is that the overlap can actually uh, obscure structure in the data. And um, I, I just wanted to demonstrate some alternatives of scatter plots for relatively dense plots. So one of them is plotting in the hex bin package. So if we load the, the hex bin package from CRAN, this is the first variant of um, working with very dense data. <clears throat> hex bin creates hexagonal bins um, that tessellate the plane and then um, looks for each of these bins, how many points fall into that, and then um, kind of like a two-dimensional histogram uh, determines which um, what the density is in, in these plots. And this is a, a hex bin plot of the same data. So you again, you see these four populations, and you see that there's a the very, very high peak um, in, in this other plot. Another variant is the smooth scatter function. This is in, in one of the basic R graphic functions. This kind of smooths out the values as a point cloud and, and again um, shows things as a, as a scatter plot. You can vary colors by density in a so-called density plot. Now here we're just overlaying all of them um, using a little larger points and showing the individual measure, uh, the individual data points. Um, and there are also specialized packages, like for example, the uh, Prada pack package in Bioconductor. <clears throat> which tells us the peak and an ellipsoid about uh, that peak in a two-dimensional normal distribution that would uh, explain, I think, the highest 10% uh, of the values or something like that. So, so basically, this one fits uh, a normal distribution and then um, looks for the normal distribution, which would segment out in two dimensions the, the, the highest values here. And then um, finally, if we don't have too many columns, we can just plot scatter plots of all against all very easily. Um, so remember our data set um, GVHD3P has, I believe, four columns. So if we, if we send all of these four columns to the plot function, by default, it plots all of them against all of them. So um, this is plotting column one against column two, 
So these are the, the different activations here. So this is CD4. Um, this is CD4 against CD8. There's kind of an anti anti -cor uh, co correlation here that they tend to be one is high if the other one is high, but again, um, in, in two different populations that, that basically are regulated differently. Um, CD4 against CD3, um, or CD8 against CD3 doesn't seem to be well correlated. So these are surface, cell surface antigens that um, are probably regulated largely independently of each other, and so on. So you can go through a plot like this and, and analyze um, the different two-dimensional influences that one has on the other. We could also put histograms side by side and look at that um, if we can get more than one histogram on a plot. Now, <clears throat> as you already see in this, this plot here, um, the R plot area can be sectioned up into different uh, sections. And this is something we set with parameters plotting parameters, the call to plotting parameters um, is, is this here. There's a, there's a code idiom that's important to remember. So if we set plotting parameters, um, the plotting parameters are maintained for basically all of the future plots until you close your plotting window. That means if I split my plotting window into two with a call to parameters, uh, then all my future plots will be at the top and then the next one at the bottom and then the next one at the top and the next one at the bottom. And that's possibly something I don't want. So setting parameters of margins or um, how large the plot is or whether I have a, a require a particular aspect ratio of, or how many plots I want can, can be kind of annoying if you don't know how to reset it. And there's an easy way to, to reset it, because the call to change any of the plotting parameters has a side effect of changing their parameters, but it also has a return value. And the return value is the original set of parameters. So the side effect is new parameters, and the return value is original parameters. Now, if I take the original parameters and I store them in a variable that is usually called OPAR for old parameters, I can then, after all my plotting is done, just reload them with a call to PAR with the old parameters. So in this way, I store my original state of parameters, and then in this way, I reload them again after my plotting is done. So here, I store them, and now I define that I want two rows and two columns of plotting area to plot in. That's now defined. So my first plot, a histogram, goes into the top left quadrant. The next plot goes into the one next to it. The next plot goes below. The next plot goes below. So I have these four histograms here now. And then I reload my parameters, so the next plot after that would be, again, a normal plot. So this is one way of um, setting up things so that you can have multiple plots um, on, the same, um, on the same plot and printing them out. So this is approximately where the script ends. There's a lot of stuff for you that you can explore at your leisure. Um, <clears throat> as I've already mentioned, 
in the last workshop, the key to profiting from this is to practice, to practice, to practice. If you go home and don't touch R and R Studio for two weeks, that's probably not a very good idea. Your brain is now primed to work with code and to work with examples. So going home and then systematically starting to work through some of these scripts may be a nice thing to go. Um, I've also yesterday heard the suggestion that people should try to get together and, and, and work on their projects uh, individually. We might, I, this, the suggestion was made, we might even add that on to a workshop in, in the future, not, not on this one. So basically, after the workshop was done, have a day where pe people can like just chill out together and, and um, talk about their projects and start practicing things that we've learned in the workshop in the context of what they actually need to do at home um, and that kind of thing. Um, that's, that's an excellent idea of, of how to proceed. So highly, highly recommend it. Um, there's a lot of material here, though. Just to, to summarize some of the principles here, we've, we've started thinking about exploratory data analysis, and we, we kind of just slipped into it and said, well, the first step of exploratory data analysis is any kind of data um, into R. So we, we looked at various versions of how we usually find data on the web as text data or as spreadsheet data, how to save that, and how to import that into an R um, object and a little bit about how to make sure that the R object that we have actually faithfully represents our data. Um, the next step then was to start exploring the data by subsetting it, picking out the 10 most highest and the 10 most lowest and asking which genes are represented and which genes are perhaps absent that we would expect to, to, to miss there and so on. So, so simply looking at what's there. The next step after that is starting to look at the data in a quantitative fashion and looking at distributions, um, plotting histograms, plotting box plots, <coughs> comparing rows against each other, and then finally getting into scatter plots which are fundamentally different in that they actually imply a mechanism of influence. So there we go. With that in hand, um, if you remember that, you know exploratory data analysis. Everything else is just refinements on the same theme. Loading in data, um, and instead of you know, looking at scatter plots, we might apply um, um, some kind of a clustering analysis, and we'll look at how to do that. But it's really doing a clustering analysis is, is, is kind of very similar to doing a scatter plot and then quantitatively picking out the clusters that we've already seen, like in graft versus host disease. So not much different. Actually, the challenge of, of scatter plot, uh, of, of clustering, is to do that as well as we can already do it by eye. Um, much of our data is going to be very high dimensional. So we've, we've looked at data here in the graft versus host disease that is four dimensional, four different channels that were measured. We have about 20 different dimensions of values in, in our, um, in our hema hematologic data. Um, if we look at gene expression um, profiles that go over very, very many different conditions, the number of columns in our data, i.e. the number of dimensions, can go literally into the thousands. And then it becomes very difficult for us to, to figure out um, where interesting concentrations of values are. So dimension reduction becomes very important. There's something called the curse of dimensionality, which uh, haunts us when we do modern data analysis because it's really very high dimensional. The curse of dimensionality basically says that <clears throat> the area of a cube grows much faster than the area of a sphere if we go into high dimensions. So that means as our data becomes very, very high dimensional, all the data is somewhere in the fringes. Uh, sorry, not the area. 
volume of a cube, of, of a hypercube, grows much faster than the volume of a hypersphere. So all the data basically is in, in the fringes. Nothing is similar to anything. And um, as our data becomes highly dimensional, we, we, it becomes difficult to find things that are actually similar. So we need to come up with intelligent ways to re reduce the number of dimensions. But fundamentally, what we're doing here is we're just finding more intelligent ways of making scatter plots. If the original data was high dimensional, and this is in dimension reduction, something we'll, we'll start talking about tomorrow. Now, it's 20 minutes to the next coffee break. I would opt to hold the coffee break earlier um, simply because we're going to go into the next unit now where we talk about regression analysis. And rather than start that off and then interrupt it midway, I think it's, it's probably a good idea to take a break now um, and then come back at um, 10 past 3 and then continue until our heads actually start spinning <laughs> with regression analysis. Um, An, is, is, is that OK? Are, are all the cookies here? Good. All right. So, so let's do that. Let's break uh, for a coffee break now. And back here at uh, 10 minutes past 2, uh, past 3. About the violin. Yeah, okay. So, like, so uh, could you give some more uh, examples when you usually use it, where it's more appropriate? Because I've been, I've been seeing that like, often times, and I thought it is now that I understood it, it's just like. Uh, well, um, so where was where was our violin part found? Violin. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. If I join? Oh, yeah. Sure, <laughs> join. But you know what? I'm actually going to put up an example here. So, <clears throat> violin plots really are useful to find um, correlations, uh, find internal structure in the data. So, I, I think I've, I've, you know, yeah, actually, this is a great example here. If, if this is a histogram, mm -hmm. it shows multimodal uh, distributions here. So what we would normally do is um, would be ideal for just box violin. plot versus violin. Um, not just bimodal, if it's multimodal as well. So ba we basically see what's going on. So let's let's have a let's have a quick look at that. Um, in that histogram, This is our box plot. We have four different boxes of these distributions here, but we don't see anything about internal structure. We might surmise that there may be a problem because we have outliers here uh, and we have outliers there. So we already think, eh, maybe the, we're not seeing all the data. But as violin plots, those bars are um, just. 1.5 times the interquartile range. Okay. The interquartile length. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is the inter. Um, this is two times the interquartile range. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So this adds 1.5. Got it. That so how about this one? It's the same, like 1.5 of this one. Yeah, this is this is 1.5 of the bottom one, and this is 1.5 of the top one. Um, mm. To the media, actually. From this from is the, the media. This is the interportal. Yeah. The box, the, 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 the length of the box is the interportal because yeah. this is 70% minus 20%, 5%. 75%, right? Yeah. 75 and uh, 75, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then it adds like 1.5 to the median, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, hmm? Lauren, could you help me out for a moment here? I just I can figure out its utility. So. <laughs> I'm trying to do a violent plot of the Graft versus Host disease, and I'm so unfamiliar with GG plot. Oh yeah. Do you, Do you know what I need to do yeah. here? Yeah. So, um, so what do you want? So it's already a data frame. Yep. I think. Yep. Is it? STR. You um, might have to melt it. Uh, it is a data frame. And so, do you want this, this, and this, and this to be different violin plots? Exactly. Yeah. So you'll need to just melt that data frame. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, yeah. I don't have melt. Uh, uh, just reshape two package. No, I leave it as using all its measure yeah, variables. Yeah, so that's fine. That's totally fine. Okay. <coughs> I just need to see the head of it. X. Awesome. So then you want to say X equals um, variable and Y equals value. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is... Oh, X equals? Mm -hmm. Like this? Uh-huh. Variable. So I use this program a lot. Um, as a string? Yep. No, not as a string. Yeah, it's the okay. weird thing about and y is value. And then um, you want that to be the big X. And then uh, plus G on violin. I think that'll give you it. Okay. If you want to go look at this like say you want to get awesome. the gene awesome. what the underlying data looks like. Yeah. So, so yeah. So this now we immediately see that our, our box plot really did obscure things that are kind of important. And uh, that's the actual underlying structure. So once again in principle you can think of this as a histogram turned sideways. On, on both sides, and it's just not that it's a histogram, it's a modeled um, density, smooth density. Like this, eh? Yeah. So these are the values of these? Yeah. So here there's, there's many values which have this, there's less values which, have, which are around 200, mm -hmm. and there's more values again which are around 80. So what are this axis? Because like in the in the so one on this, one. this axis, this is categorical. So oh, this okay. is our CD4, gotcha. CD8, CD3, gotcha. and CD8. Gotcha. So just like in the bar plot. So in, in the bar plot, we had 
Because in the pony you did like one violin. This year? Yeah. So it's the same thing? Gotcha. Right? But now we have these shapes here where there's a high density and, and where, there's a, where there's a low density. So where's the outliers now? So now they just disappear. Right, so we don't show the outliers uh, individually. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you can see the media on here as well, right? Right, there's probably ways to do that in, G, in, in ggplot. Um, Lauren is my resident ggplot artist. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, when we come back together, I'm just going to show this in, in the code snips, and then maybe Lauren will want to add how so we can, put so the media in there and outliers. Okay. Thank you. We can give it nice colors.